Welcome back, everyone. I wanted to go into greater detail about the biblical significance of the olive tree because last time we looked at the scientific significance, and I thought that was powerful given that there were 73 plus thousand species of trees that could have been chosen to represent Israel and us being grafted into Israel as a part of that olive tree. And so with that many options, it's not random or a coincidence that the olive tree was chosen because our Father knows His creation. He knows that we have 46 chromosomes and that we pass on 23 to our offspring to equal a total of 46 when combined. He designed us in a masterful way to be able to do that and have our genetics come together to let the miracle of life continue on. And so that 46 chromosome aspect of the olive tree and the 46 chromosome aspect of us and the grafting in, yes, that's really, really cool. But I think it's important that we look at some of the cool biblical connections as well, because there's a lot. So I'm going to go over them and talk about some things that blow my mind as I dive deeper into this. And one of those things has to do with the end times, when the return happens, when the world is uniting to battle against the Most High. Where are His feet going to touch down? Zechariah 14 tells us that His feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. So right after His olive branches are gathered up, and they are warring against him, Armageddon, his feet are going to touch down on the Mount of Olives. How powerful is that? Prepared for battle, look out. His children have already been taken care of. There are going to be some survivors of Armageddon, but for the most part, the ones that are united against him are going to be taken out. And so this is a powerful event right here, mentioned in Zechariah the Mount of Olives being the place. But when we look back at where the Messiah was sitting, when his disciples were asking him about the end time events, he was sitting on the Mount of Olives. But what really blew my mind was something one of you guys shared with me in the comments, and I added it to my notes, and it has to do with the temple. Because the Messiah was talking to the Pharisees, and he said to them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. So remember, the Jews, they were really, really confused. And they said, 40 and 6 years was this temple in the building. So basically, it took 46 years to build that temple. There's that number 46. Again, it's not random. 46 chromosomes. And so 46 years, that's a year for each chromosome. Really, really cool. And the reason that is significant, you see later on, is he wasn't speaking about that actual temple. He was talking about his body being resurrected in those three days. And so really cool aspect with the body being looked at as a temple here, but it's not the only place. Corinthians or 1 Corinthians tells us just that, that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And so that is Another verification, there's a temple aspect with the body. And then you have, in John chapter 20, Mary, who is crying at the tomb of the Messiah. There's these two angels, one sitting at the feet and one sitting at the head. And they're asking her why she's crying. And she says, because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said... She turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. And Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Essentially, why are you crying? Whom seekest thou? She supposing him to be a gardener. That's significant. Someone else brought that to my attention in the comments as well. So I'm blessed that I'm reading these things and seeing the things that you all are sharing. Because I wouldn't have made that connection either. And the thing about grafting in that we talked about before is that it's not a natural process. It requires a gardener to do this. And a big part of the Messiah's mission, why he came, was not just to reach all of Israel, but beyond those sheep outside the sheep pen, bringing them back in. And so that is something I believe is significant as well. Why did she think he was a gardener and, and not some other type of worker? It's for a reason. 
And so she eventually, of course, recognized him when he said her name without her introducing herself. And so that is really cool things associated with the end times and the Messiah. But I'm, now I'm going to go in order with things that are significant about the olive tree, and hopefully you guys can see some more connections. We all see things differently. That's what's beautiful about this movement. And so going back to the flood, you guys remember that story? After the flood, they're hoping to find dry land, and they're sending out a dove. And what does that dove bring back? 73,000 different types of trees it could have chosen. It chose the olive branch. Came back with an olive branch in its mouth. How beautiful is that? Powerful stuff, guys. It gets even better. There's a lot more. That olive tree served a purpose in the temple. You need light. What's going to power that light source? Olive oil. So the fruits produced by the branches, providing the oil for the lamp in the temple. How cool is that? Olive oil right there. I don't even know why. I never thought of olive oil as being something used for light sources, but that's what they did back then. I'd love to try that now and see how bright that is. But not only that, it served different purposes in the temple. Right here in 1 Kings, when they're building the temple, it says that he made two cherubims of olive tree, each 10 cubits high. And then again, chapter 6, a little bit further on, it says, For the entering of the oracle he made doors of olive tree. Olive trees are shaped in a unique way. It would be hard to make a door out of them. They would either need a really massive table saw or some really good carpentry work there. And so the doors made of olive tree, the lintel and the side post were a fifth part of the wall, and the two doors also were of olive trees. So really, really cool using the olive trees right there. Again, it's not random. Lots of other trees to choose from. And then we have King David saying, I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. And that trust is a big deal. You're always hearing people talk about faith, and that faith is trust. And I say that from experience, not just because my brother told me that, as he did, but when I received the powerful miracle I did years ago, probably 17 years ago now, it's been a while, the last words that I spoke before I had the miracle were, I trust you. And wow, <laughs> the miracle came on quickly. I wasn't asking to be healed, essentially. I was just saying, I need to be healed, and I trust you, and I was healed instantly. And so those words, trusting in him, are extremely important. And so there's that green olive tree aspect. And we see this here in Hosea as well, further on. When it's talking about the Father healing their backsliding, talking about Israel, he says, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from them. I will be as the dew unto Israel. He shall grow as the lily and cast forth his roots as Lebanon. His branches shall spread and his beauty shall be as the olive tree. And so Paul, like we talked about last time, using the olive tree as the particular type of tree that Israel is grafted into. It wasn't something he made up. He was familiar with these texts. And so there is the prophecy in Hosea referring to Israel as an olive tree. And we see that again in Jeremiah, where it says, Yahuwah called thy name a green olive tree, fair and of goodly fruit. With the noise of a great tumult, he hath kindled fire upon it, and the branches of it are broken. And you remember last time we were talking about that grafting in, Paul was basically saying, don't look at the branches that are cast down and think you're better. Just like they were cast down for unbelief, it can happen to us as well. We have to be humble. We can't think we're better because we've been grafted in. And again, like Paul said, it's not a natural process. It requires an expert gardener to do. You can't just have anybody graft a branch in. You have to learn how to do it. There's a technique. And so it says here, for the Lord of hosts, that planted thee hath pronounced evil against thee for the evil of the house of Israel and of the house of Judah, which they have done against themselves to provoke me to anger and offering incense unto Baal. So these people, Israel and Judah, making him angry, worshiping false gods, there's a reason they were cast down. It wasn't because we're better than them and that was done for us. 
It was done because of their unbelief, their transgressions, turning away, taking up false deities. So that was Jeremiah. Now we're going to look at Zechariah. This is where it gets into Revelation. And my wife brought this to my attention months ago, and I didn't realize it was as significant as it is until now. And so the two witnesses, that's what it ties into. I'll go ahead and give you the spoiler right there. The two witnesses, I believe, mentioned right here in Zechariah. And it's thanks to my precious wife for bringing that to my attention, where she said, go look at Zechariah and see what it talks about in chapter four. And here it is. He's seeing things, and he says, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick, all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof, and two olive trees. By it, one upon the right side of the bowl, and the other upon the left side thereof. Then answered I, this is reading on in verse 11, and said unto him, what are these two olive trees? Because of course, when you see things in a vision, you want to know what, what does that mean? And so he's asking, what does that mean? What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, what be these two olive branches? Now he's calling them branches. I think that's interesting which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves. And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. So there's two anointed ones represented by olive trees here in Zechariah. Like I said, there's two witnesses in Revelation. And guess what John is being shown here? It says here, I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. How cool is that? And those olive trees, they're protected when they're here. For a time, because it says, If any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. So, those two witnesses in Revelation, those are just a few of the connections I could find with the olive trees, not just representing what we're grafted into, but representing the two witnesses. And a lot of people have different opinions about the two witnesses. Some people think it's two figures. Some people think that some people think it's two groups of people. I'll let you guys draw your own conclusions. I don't want to teach on that because I'm not an expert in this topic. I have my own thoughts and opinions, and I don't want to muddy the waters with those opinions. I want to know something for sure before I speak about it. And so the 46 chromosome aspect, getting back into that real quick. We talked about the olive tree, but I feel there's something significant. It ties into Revelation as well in terms of the two choices we have because the olive tree isn't the only thing out there with 46 chromosomes. There are some creatures in the animal kingdom that also have 46 chromosomes. And one of them, I think, really caught my attention just based on the way it looks. It is called the blue bull. And it has 46 chromosomes. This thing is a unique creature. I have never seen one of these. These aren't where I live. These are on a different continent. But these things are massive. And I'm calling this thing the blue bull. It's also called the Asian antelope or the Bosolaphus tragocamelus, if I'm saying that right. Big names. So I like to call it the blue bull. It's easier to say. Or Nilgai. And this thing, if you look at its horns, it reminds me a lot of those devil figures we were shown as children. I remember being shown the devil all the time with horns, and they looked very, very similar to the horns on this creature. But again, it has 46 chromosomes. It is a beast of a creature, and I think that is significant because we really have two options. We can choose to be grafted in to the olive tree, or we can choose to be grafted in to the false world beast system where you have to make a conscious decision to break the commandments. 
to bow to the golden statue like they did in Babylon, so to speak. There's all these different options that we're going to have in the future, but it boils down to who are we choosing? Are we choosing the world? Or are we choosing the word? And we have to choose our father's words. And like young King David, put our trust in him. All of your trust. If you're leaning on this world and trusting it, it's going to fall away. If you're leaning on him, he will never move. He is not going to leave you. And that is the powerful thing that I want to share with you about our Father. His love and mercy endures forever. He's given us a greater understanding of how powerful His Word is, how provably true it is, and it's fun to put it to the test. And so I wanted to share these things to help you guys out, seeing the connections that prove, like I said at the start of this, that the Bible is more than a science book. It is changing lives when people put it to the test. And it's changing my life. I've been blessed so much by the experience. And I encourage all of you to have no doubt. Put it to the test. You're going to find out it's true. And that's what this journey is about. And so I just wanted to share that and see what you guys had to add to the equation. I know you have a lot more to add. And so I thank you for all that you have added already, all the support. You guys are a major blessing. If you want to support us, now would be a great time. I have some news coming up that you'll understand why I'm going to need support. I'm going to need a lot of help pretty soon with some things that have been happening or are going to happen. And so I thank you again, all of you, for uniting with us, helping us out, being such a blessing. Humble truth seekers out there, you guys are what our Father is looking forward to meeting. You're His inheritance. Be humble and understand that. You are the inheritance of the creator of everything. He's looking forward to meeting you. So look forward to getting to know him, spending time with him, and making that a priority. And it will bless you. I can guarantee it. So I love you. The Father loves you. Thanks for tuning in with us and joining us on this adventure. We love you. The Father loves you. And we will see you next time.